started tonight. Okay? So, uh, Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your provision, for your love, and your sustaining grace in our lives, and just and the power and your will that you have to get us through. And we ask continual blessings on each and every one. That you would touch Vicky's knee and heal her up from her uh, surgery, and, and she mentioned that the pain is not as bad. And that's that's good, and the recovery of the therapy starts soon for her. And may she get back to uh, full range of motion with that. Continue blessings on Todd's shoulder after his surgery. Uh, for my own illness, you can take these things away, but in the meantime, uh, use these to lie us down in green pastures and teach us to just rest in you and be at peace with what it is you're doing. It's, uh, I know it's frustrating for me at times. I just want to make sure that I'm always honest about, Lord, how you know my heart and know my feelings and know everything about us. So we just uh, lean on you and trust you and want you in this time to be our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, and our one who explains all things from your word and to help us understand and see more of you and understanding more, appreciating of you and also of the importance of this book you've given us that's alive and changes our hearts, minds, and souls and spirits. So we thank you for watching over each and every one, continuing to be with uh, <coughs> Todd, Pam, Vicki, Dave, Greg, Sandy, Lane and her, and her family, and all the families, and Sheila, and, and Lionel, and thank you for her little grandbabies over there, and well, not a little, ten and seven, but Aaron and <sighs> and, and Father, I just ask each and every one that you would just um, you would just really watch over uh, all of us in the congregation, your people, with Nancy Harbor and Hugo and and Jim, and Father, we just ask you to guide, direct, and bless each and every one. We thank you so much for all you have done and continue to do. We ask this study to be in your honor tonight. In Jesus' and Shula's name we pray. Amen. So, sorry, a little, I'm a little weak because um, I took this. Well, and he said he needs to go home and rest. He is breathless. No, I, <laughs> I was, it's coughing. I was coughing a lot, as you probably can hear. Um, but I do feel, you know, I just want to make sure that we, you know, at least in an hour of, of studies, better than zero. So we'll, we'll continue on. I wanted to just, what's that? You can hear me breathing hard? Wow. Well, I didn't know that's a, wow. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing. Well, uh, I can tell you a couple of things to, to just get you updated on where we were at and the lessons that will, and what I'll do is I'll talk slower and I won't be as high energy to save energy. <laughs> uh, but we were at with the study on the spiritual growth cycle chart on page 24. What I'll do is I'll just cover a few verses in here uh, to really catch us up because the idea is to get through this uh, by Sunday. Uh, because after that, then we'll have Palm Sunday and then we'll have Easter Sunday messages to have on our docket. Uh, so let's go into uh, this process of, of going through page 24. Uh, we left off uh, a little bit of the precious faith promise, the highlighted precious faith promise there. And I looked, and right before that, I put on there that there's a first fruit of the katisma that they will experience. Uh, this is the anir of the sperma. And again, to be remindful of where we're at in, in the process, we're talking about a duality of growth of people that there's two different types of people in the entire planet. There's those that are not of covenant. There's that don't know the God of the Bible. There's those of covenant that know there's only one God, and that's the God of the Bible. And there's also those that, the third group of people, that are taking that understanding of covenant into in testament by putting their understanding and belief and trust that God gave them to see Yeshua, Yamashiach, Jesus Christ, as 
God the Son, the Son of God, who is God incarnate, our Savior. So once they're in Testament, um, that begins a whole different study of those groups of people. So again, of the whole planet, you have those not of covenant, those of covenant, those in Testament. From those in Testament, we basically have two groupings of growth, those that grow within the initial uh, word of God that they were given once they are covered by the blood of Christ and how they would apply that blood in their lives and grow in sanctification, reconciliation, and fruit bearing. Through that comes also confession, repentance, ongoing through that process. A question was asked to me this week uh, by somebody. When someone has done a wrong and they say, I've repented, is there an easy way to find out if they're sincere? And I want to judge the person. It's a good question. One of the best ways to, to look for that, not to be a judge, but to be someone who assesses and who's as shrewd as a serpent and as gentle as a dove, as Jesus says, you take inventory of just what you observe. And repentance is twofold, don't forget. So the metamelamai, turning from sin, is one thing. But the metanoia, turning to God, is quite another. And for those folks who struggle with maybe understanding that, as you talk to or your, yourselves, look no further than the story of Peter and Judas, and you would remind yourself that I mentioned to this person, you know, both of them betrayed Jesus. Both of them uh, were not happy about it. Both of them were heart-wrenched about it. One committed suicide, and one was restored. What was the difference? Because they both repented, it says in the Bible. So when you see that thought come into play, most people don't even address that. They don't want to look at the twofold process of repentance. So yeah, many people can repent and turn away from their sin. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt Judas' heart on that. What I doubt is the turning to God, that the belief that God will forgive and restore and reconcile and bring you at peace with him. Peter had a chance to believe that. Judas did not. And the reality, it's so sad, is that we have to always remember that about our Father. No matter how far we fall, how far we go, He will restore and will, will bring us up. So the answer to the question, how can you tell when someone repents, is really not a, a, an exact question. It should, see, it should be, the question should be, how can you tell when someone repents in both facets? So in the early facet, you know, you got to take them at face value from what they've said. they got to turn away from their sin and not do it. That's easy to know if they, whatever the sin they were, sorry of doing and they got to stop doing it um, as far as the other part of it and how are they once they make somebody a victim of their of their sin how do they show they've repented to God and had God to make peace with them about making right that's because they involuntarily want to give restitution so involuntary restitution follows one who is doing both facets of repentance one who turns from sin puts it off one who turns to God gives restitution to the victims that they wronged without having to be told. It's innate. They just want to do it. So with that being said, that persons who are in the Testament relationship with God the Father through the blood of God the Son, Jesus Christ, they grow in this process. And we call that the sporos seed, the Word of God. As they continue to grow, the maximum fruit yield they have is a hundredfold fruit. Of the hundredfold fruit, then the next tier of that understanding is that a few, not all. It's not because they're not, they're not deserving. It's not because they're not uh, good enough. It's because God just chooses who he wants to choose. He mentions in Ephesians 1 how he earmarked people out and earmarks out for a higher uh, calling. And so within that frame, if you think about uh, the phrase by camera we use, it's used in our political pundits of describing our congressional makeup of the House representatives and the Senate makeup of Congress. Well, the congressional makeup of the people of God are of those of the sporos and those of the sperma in a general sense, and there's positions within there. So those of the sperma are those that after growing through the blood of Christ, understanding of the word of God and the sporos, who have then been given a secret of the kingdom of the God, and then not because of anything else, because God just wanted to, to do that. It starts with being elected, selected, 
uh, to do so by him. And then an invitation to a, a heavenly calling. So they were already uh, in Christ, and then they became, as once they were, once they were already in Christ, then they're called uh, to, to walk in the, the light of that truth. So the calling of uh, the Bible is initially talking to not people of covenant, but those in testament, to walk worthy of the blood of the Lamb which covered their sin. Just like those in the sperma who were elected or selected, they are now being called to walk into an invitation of the uh, heavenly kingdom because they were elected and selected to hear about things regarding some depth of God's word of the seed within the seed, which is what sperma means. It's a seed inside of a seed, and we always use the peach seed as the analogy. So we're just doing a surmise where we are so far in our chart. And again, for those of you listening and thinking, what are you talking about? Uh, if you're listening online and you've never heard me before in your life or what I've said, you can go to our website, www.pfbcstudies.com. And, and you can also go there and, and you can see uh, the under the sermons tab a, a PDF Word doc that I'm speaking from. You can print it off yourself and look at it. Uh, so where we left off on the growth cycle chart of those that are given that sperma, so they too grow in the same fashion, but they start from ground zero again on that new level of knowledge. So that new level of knowledge grows them and they go through the same process. So we looked at the uh, Greek words and the Hebraic um, parallels to them, referencing the brephos and the mepios and the mikros and the pation and the technon and the niskos and the near. All words in the Bible I did not make up that define the growth of one physically. And all we did was align that spiritually, how they're used in the scripture. So as we continue to move on, we've, we've arrived at the last person on that chart who is in the near of the sperma, who, unlike the, those of sporos, the maximum fruit yield is by one person in the near, a hundredfold of the word of God. That's what the word of God produces, a hundredfold fruit. The secret of the kingdom of the God produces three types of fruit, 30, 60, and 100. And it's given in two portions. And so the 30 and 60 fruit are done by the naniskos, the younger men and women. And then the mature men and women are, are those who do the hunter fruit. So that's later on as described uh, as the faithful ones. Uh, and then the called out ones, we used to call chosen it's the word that should say ekletoi or called out ones. So to be technical, our old uh, verbiage, uh, so it says, you know, called, you know, chosen faithful, it should say called, called out faithful. So you have the called ones, kletoi, the called ones to the airship of earth, under full fruit saying. The called out ones, those who are the maidens, the bridal maidens, who make up 30 and 60 fruit yields, consisting of wise and foolish virgins. And then you have the faithful ones who are of the hundred fruit yield. So with that being said, we're looking at the hundred fruit yield person who is uh, on page 24, um, he, he or she, and they're looking at uh, wanting to be in this day eight as a bridegroom, with, with the bridegroom as the bride. And they are the first fruit of the katisma. They will experience a salvation number seven, which is a so great salvation. And this is their diochoesis dikaiosus, justification number eight, from disinheritance from the heavens and the precious faith promise as the church of Philadelphia, as I'm reading from page 24, on you see the highlight on your page. Now, before I get further, I want to also, on the board, I didn't get to cover it with you on Sunday, but I wrote here, if you can read, I have a little scratch mark there, my apologies. I've already put on the board before the, the oikia, but I also wanted to align that from oikia and oikos, if I Mind you, we talked about that from a couple weeks ago. Um, so it's because there's the oikia, oikos, and then the, the oikos. I want to align that with the creation words. So you have katesis, creation, aligns with oikia. The katesis aligns with oikos. And then the katisma aligns with the, the, the oikos. So you have the alignments here. And now out of the katisma or the oikos comes the first fruits of the katisma, which is the faithful ones. And that's where we're at on, on this chart. So I want to make sure you can follow that as well. Okay. So 
as we go uh, forward on page 24, I, I show you how in, uh, they're going to turn to a couple of scriptures, and we can see this. So in Hebrews 2, 3, So Hebrews 2, verse 3. He said, how shall we escape? Now, first of all, I want you to, I put that verse there, but I want to get some background so you see the context of the audience is. So in verse 14 of the previous chapter 1 of Hebrews, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth for service? on account of those being about to inherit salvation, referring angels in verse 13. So they're ministering spirits, but for who? For those being about to inherit salvation. Is that everybody in Christ? No. Is it everybody in sperma? No. So it's, it's an elected group of folks who are in a position to inherit. And so we, I've mentioned this to you before, that we all have, I would say, there are garrisons of angels to look oversee you in a general sense and for anybody in Christ. I'm not going to be any problem with that, but what I would say to you is that there's more of a personal assignment of an individual when you are in a position to inherit. Much like you had a more personal attention from the Lord Himself to Job. Like you had a more personal attention mentioned of Israel from from Gabriel, from not excuse me, from Michael, um, the archangel. <coughs> Pardon me, I had to cough. And right now, I think I'm drawing a blank. Right now, Gabriel talked to Daniel early in the Bible, and when he gave him the prophecy, but now I can't recall who was the one that was buffeted by Satan. Was it Michael or Gabriel in the book of Daniel? My mind's playing tricks on me right now. I can't remember. But none, uh, nonetheless, he was buffeted. by. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that we saw that whole piece of that fall into line here. There was a per personal assignment for more endearing that you would have. And obviously, Satan didn't go after anybody who followed Jesus, remember? He wanted to sift Peter like wheat, is what Jesus said. And he possessed Judas, as the Bible says. So we see that, yes, there is, Satan doesn't like anybody who's in Christ, no doubt. But he goes after those who he can use to create the, the most damage. Uh, the one who, again, Jesus called a friend, but more of a secondary friend. And then with Peter, the one who would always be the, the person who would be willing to speak and not be ashamed of being embarrassed, willing to put his, himself out there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's that's what I'm thinking too. My mind's just not with me right now. I, I want to say that I was gonna I was gonna double down on what I thought, but I but I don't. I'm questioning myself right now, and my I'm, 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 I don't know what happened. I just had a brain uh, pause there, like oh my gosh, which one was that? I want to say I know I know for a fact Gabriel talked to him in Daniel nine about the prophecy of you know the Messiah to come, and I know that. But what I and that's the one when Daniel said, you know, he himself included himself in being a person who's a sinner amongst the people. He was very humbled and, and, and contrite. But I could almost think it was Michael who said he wanted to come to you early, but the prince of Persia buffeted me. I, that's what I'm, I'm almost certain it was him. But I'm not, but I don't want to say that without she, knowing. She said just checked and that is right. It was right? Okay. That's what my gut was telling me, but for some reason I was questioning myself. Um, but because they were they were both in the same book, and I, my mind just said to me, "That don't sound right." But my memory's like, "Well, that's right." <laughs> so, so anyway, I just I was in a conflict there internally. Um, so, so going back to the Hebrews passage about the angels and context in verse thirteen of chapter one. That's the mentioning of the ministering spirits in verse fourteen of Hebrews chapter one, which means they're ministering spirits to those who inherit. And that's why he goes on in chapter 2 in the context on this account. It behooves us to attend more earnestly to the things heard, lest we should ever let them glide away. For if the word spoken 
through angels was firm in every dis deviation and disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape having disregarded so great a salvation which beginning to be spoken by the Lord was confirmed for us by those who heard him? So the so great salvation in Hebrews 2, 3 he's speaking of is the so great salvation I mentioned on page 24 of the spiritual growth cycle chart that is on the PDF called Spiritual Growth Cycle Chart explained, explained and Expounded, the Word document, referring to the so great salvation that is offered to those in that area of inheritance, those who are in a position to inherit day eight are only going to be there if they are first able to be in a position to enter day seven. So therefore, the so great salvation is day eight, and therefore to be disclosed as the bride, to be declared as the bride. So before you're the betrothed bride in day seven, that's how they, you know who they are, the faithful ones, and you know who the maidens are. But the maidens and the bride and the betrothed bride in day seven, both of them are afforded the opportunity to become that consummated bride with the bridegroom in day eight. So the so great salvation is the, is the so great glory declaration of the revealed apocalypse, if you will, the revelation of Christ and his glory as the bridegroom. He is finally taking his rightful place to sit on that throne in heaven. And the entire thousand years prior in day seven, he was ruling the heavens and ruling the earth, but he was reigning on the throne of David on the physical earthly Jerusalem fulfillment of the prophecy, he would sit on the Father's throne of David. So that's what he was doing in the fulfillment of the messianic uh, prophecy. So that's what's why, it's why it's so great, because you get to be there, be a part of, not just a part, but the most endearing part of, like he said, the overcomer's promise to sit in my throne. He's talking about that process of thought to share uh, what God shares his glory with no man. And yet he, in, 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 a, in, a, in an un explainable way, in a baffling way, um, it consummates his love and to the deepest intimacy with these group of people uh, that he calls the bride. Not everybody in Christ, but those of that uh, unique position. So we go on in the scripture in James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 18. I also mentioned that the uh, anir of the sperma we're looking at is also a katisma. We're looking at the anir of sperma. Okay? So the the katisma in verse 18 of James 1, he says, Having will that he begot us by the word of truth in order that we might be a first fruit of his creatures. And that is the katisma, but not this, the katisma, the first fruits of his katisma. And look when he says he willed it, it was his baluma, his predisposition. And we've already seen that in Ephesians 1. He's already been predisposed to want to have these groupings, these order of things. And God's not a, a nasty person to say, you know, this is one level of thing, this is a different level, this is a higher level of thing that I want close to me or more endearing to me. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Christianity has distorted it so much. The churchianity view of God is a, a social communism of, of liberalism that nothing is needed to be differentiated about. When you look at the Bible, just the opposite is true. Did not the Jews have tons of rules to go by? Besides their laws, they had processes of, of, of just common manners and decencies. I don't just mean the laws of, you know, the sab Sabbath or how they approached their sacrifice. Just daily living. You, on the, every time I look around me on these walls, we have these pictures up of these things that are stat statement of fact. I mean, I mean, the tribal uh, encampments, the, the temple building, the, the priestal sacrifice system, the vessels used, the priestal Kohathite, Maronite, and Gershonite roles and responsibilities, all those things just shout out and resonate. Are you kidding me that God does not have an order of things? Yes, He does. And in the New Testament, those who say, well, that's old, that's not new. Well, sure, it's in the New Testament, too. He, he commissioned the 70 in Luke, and He does another 12 uh, close that are close to him, we call the apostles. And he has the three he always brings close to them. And of those three, he has the beloved apostle John, who he in charge to take care of his, his mother, who he never calls mother. And it's just, it, 
there is a clear indication of, a, of, of an order of things. And we're about to talk about it coming up in a few weeks where when he rose from the dead, the, the women and only the women saw him in that morning. Not till late that day did Cleopas, as the only man, uh, get a visual of him. Peter passed by him and didn't know it, but Cleopas, you know, if you want to count Peter, okay. So you got Cleopas and you got Peter. Peter didn't know he saw him. Cleopas knew he saw him. And then not until the following day, which was in a Jewish calendar after 6 p.m., that night, then the rest of the apostles saw minus Thomas. And of course, Judas, unfortunately, not, not being alive any longer. But you got to remember, these women meant a lot. Six women saw him. But, but there's not an order of things? Of course there is. And of course, those women, Mary Magdalene and Mary, his mother, were highlighted. There is a constant emphasis on the order of things, on the order of things, on the order of things. And don't you think it's important in the book of Acts? As the book of Acts begins, and we never see the pairing ever of Peter and John, ever. And yet, when the end of the book of John ends, and Peter's like, hey, what about him? You just gave me this gruesome death I'm going to have in my future. What about his gruesome future? And Jesus, like, basically paraphrased, says, you know, leave that to me. It's not your business. But what does he do? He then pairs Peter with John to show Peter, I love you, man. You are going to be the, fo the, the face and voice of Christianity, and you are going to be paired with the one that I, I declare to everybody to take charge of my mama. As a Jewish law, that shows a lot of loving and endearment to that man. And I've already been told you guys that he's the one that I love. So what's that say about you, that I paired you with him? <laughs> You're come back full circle, Peter. There's no animosity about what you did, denying me three times. It's over. It's over. I don't bring it back up again like 1 Corinthians 13 says. Love holds no records of wrong because God is love, and that describes him. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, say you forgave, you already repented for that, but I'm going to hold it to my account ledger so I can pull it back when I want to to shove it in your face to make you feel bad. He never he doesn't do that. Humans do that. God never does that. God's beautiful like that. It's awesome. We can be, we can be penitent about one thing, have a litany of things we don't even remember, and because we're penitent and broken about that one thing, 1 John 1 9, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And just wash them all away, man. It's the most awesome, beautiful thing of all time. And then so when you see Him, He's like, yeah, that never happened. I, I, I can't do that. I can't forgive and forget. He can do both. And then thirdly, go forward in such a way as if you're as close as ever before. You know, the closest I can ever Get, a, get an experience of that is what God did for me on February 25th with a stepdaughter's wedding. Having some moments in the past that I never thought, I never thought in my lifetime I'd have this, I'd have this moment where every time we've talked since and seen each other since, it's been as if we've always been endearing father and daughter kind of conversations. And I think, I think it's, I'm looking at it now, just, just now coming to me right now, it may be a semblance of God giving me the idea of what it must feel like to be with him one day in the heavenlies when I and you who hold some of these things that we think, well, he, God hasn't forgotten it, he, but he has. If you genuinely have said, you know, I, I lay it at your feet, Lord, and I, 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 that's awful what I've done, then, then, then it's over. It's over. It, this doesn't exist anymore for him. And so for me, I just, it doesn't exist anymore, except for, the only thing, but for me, it has like a sense of reference as a glorified way of knowing the depth of what, what was to now what is for the deeper appreciation of the love and joy and peace that I have. So, so it's just an amazing thing about how God has done that. And that's God's balloon my will wanting things to be the way they are. And he wants to be, have things in order. Okay. And so we also know First Corinthians 15, he says that we all raise our own togma or order, means rank, right? So, the next verse I want to look at here on page uh, 24 of your spiritual growth cycle chart is the Second Peter, which is what our congregation is named after. Um, Second Peter chapter one, uh, two to four, excuse me, one to four. My apologies. Second Peter chapter one, one to four. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained an equally precious faith. So I remember people and. Not recently, but time to time, people were thought we were um, those that were of a little aloof. I'm not going to say the word, but they would think, oh, you're an all-inclusive, all you know, a really liberal congregation because you have a real 
a dainty name like precious. And I said, be careful what you say. That word's in the Bible, man. It's not a bad word. It's like the word rainbow. I don't see how a whole group of people who, who represent something that they say God does not say and God does say it in the Bible about what's right and wrong, they're going to sit here and say, we own refracted light. No, I don't think so, buddy. I don't think so. God owns refracted light. He made it, and he did it because he wanted to give a promise he wouldn't flood the earth again. So that's the first mention of it. I'm, I'm going I'm to stick with that. It doesn't belong to a group of people or leprechauns or the Irish. No. No, no, no. It doesn't belong to unicorns and I love, I love me, Tony. No. It belongs to God. God said it. God made it. And God had the purpose for it. So I'm not ashamed to, 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 to say precious faith either because that's in the Bible. I don't care how it sounds, how people think it means in today's society. Hogwash. God said it. Good enough for me, man. The precious blood of Christ, he says that too. So, you know, <laughs> and he also says precious promises in verse 4 in the same chapter here we're in. So as we continue to read further, equally, equally precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. May favor and peace be multiplied to you by a knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus. And you have to see your knowledge there is your epinosis. I want you to have a deeper experiential knowledge in what we know about the kingdom of things. Yes. I tell people the name of the church, they ask if it's a black church. <laughs> and that's when you say, uh, the pastor guy has 1% Algerian. I do. In my DNA, I got 1% Algerian, so Africa, baby. <laughs> it's in my blood. But then again, you probably knew that. <laughs> I think I got a higher dose of that, maybe. I know what you mean, though, because that name, they tend to get the, our, 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 our black uh, people in Christ, our, our, our friends in Christ, which I have quite a few I've known through the years, and I could say they do have longer names usually, um, and they tend to have more of a, a descriptive names. So, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I got some people that are part of congregational ministries that are all black ministries, and and the other day, one of them called me, for example, and he said, he called me Press. Hey, Press. All my brothers, they call me Press. Hey, Press. So you know, I was just calling down the list of the family, man. I see people are doing, how you doing, man? How you doing, man? What's going on? How you doing? How's the, how's the Lord treating you, man? What's going on with the Lord? Is you still doing good ministry? Y'all doing, you thriving, man? Remember, it's not about the numbers. It's about the heart, man. I, I know. We're doing good. We're doing good. So we just go, every now and then, we have those conversations, and and so I know what you mean, though, because I love the fact that God makes people different and makes us all unique and distinct, and, and we can you know, give and take from each other and learn. And, and that's what I wish that, I wish that's what Christianity, how it started, would have stayed that way. It was Jew and Gentile mixed, you know, darker-skinned people with lighter-skinned people. If you think about it, that's what that was. Gentiles weren't the same color skin tone as Jewish people were. Didn't call it black and white, but it sure was darker and lighter skin for a fact. Romans were a lighter skin tone, let's get real, than, than you had those people over in, in the Jew, Jewish line. And other countries around also had various skin tones, and they were all just an amalgamation of one people. It's pretty awesome days back in those days where they didn't have that issue. You know, They were all just cohabitating. What a wonderful, could you imagine if I could have been a fly in the wall of the church in Antioch, the congregation in Antioch, the first mix of, of at least half being Gentile, I would have loved to have seen the color of the skin of those people. I bet you it was a variety of a rainbow of people. I, I, I'm almost bare, I guarantee you. You didn't have lighter or darker, you had a whole mix in between, darker, lighter, and in between. I bet you. I bet, but it would have been beautiful to see that and how they all got along and had not one member. Remember early on in, the, in their early followings of each other, there wasn't one disagreement for 11 years. They were good. They were good for 11 years, just happy-go-lucky. Never, dis never, a dis never a divisiveness, never a dispute, never a despairing. And remember the first thing that broke them up? Wasn't doctrine. Wasn't doctrine. It was over a social issue of how to love a widow who was Jewish, who was Greek-influenced, Hellenized, versus those who were the conservative Jews in Jerusalem. Interesting. Like it is today, our social issues divide us. 
more so than our doctrinal issues. It's very sad. And that's why social issues drive the forefront of our society and our world and of our churchianity than does the scriptural issues. Isn't that true? When was the last time you heard of a scriptural issue you know, being the reason why they mainstream uh, believers today you know, have a, you know, indifference? You hear about it from time to time, but the major topic nowadays through the airwaves and magazines and everywhere else is, is social issues all the time. It's like that matters more than anything else. But anyway, I digress. So, 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, equal light, precious faith. Uh, may favor and peace, again, be multiplied to you by the knowledge, or I should say in the knowledge. So when you have a deeper understanding of experience with the kingdom of the heavens and the secret kingdom of the God, it should give you more peace and more, it says favor, that word is grace, or charis more of God's will and ability to do what he needs to in your life. You should have a bitter, the more you grow, the more you grow in God's experiential knowledge of his, of his word, it's going to remind you of his ability and his power to do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. And that gives you peace, not animosity or regrets or anger, because how'd you do that in my life? No, no, no. The peace to know that he's in control. I was mentioning to um, our wonderful sister, Sandy, and it's a earmark that I have come to terms with in recent years. That when I always say to myself, why did God subject me or anyone else to this or that or the other? It's not good. Um, it's a newness for me. In the last couple of years, I've, I've, I don't know if I've said it as much to, to you guys, but I'll say it now. And, and that is, it isn't like he's playing by a different set of rules. It's easy as a human being to get kind of distraught or not so happy about the fact that well, yeah, God, I'm growing and being multiplied, like you said here in verse two of First Peter, but or Second Peter chapter one, verse two. You said, "My high staff, your grace and your peace, be multiplied me because of the knowledge." But actually, the opposite sometimes incurs where I get kind of depressed or sad or, or I scratch my head and, and just bewilderment of why did you do such a thing? And he would say, "Wait, I don't subject you to rules that I don't myself subject myself to already." Remember that whole cross thing? And I go, "Oh yeah, that's right." So he who has the power, God Almighty, he and she who do not, human beings, we sometimes feel the way I just mentioned. And God goes, I had the power to not subject myself to any of those feelings, but I did. Okay, you got me at that point. What you willingly ordained to be subjected to such an uh, unbelievable state of being God's son. Okay. But then secondly, you go and get a gruesome, violent, vicarious death we're going to talk about coming up on Easter. But, but without that, we don't have what we have as a resurrection, which is the greatest thing ever in the history of mankind. It, it's, like, it, it's like this unbelievable. It validates everything the Bible says. Everything is validated because of that. So even his birth, which was tremendous, light broke forth through darkness, even that becomes a little bit assuaged if the resurrection doesn't take place because then it kind of makes people doubt the fact that it was really him. And so the resurrection is the emphatic explanation point. That birth, that was for real. That was him. I mean, it just kind of, they're both bookends, no, no doubt. That's why you have those Christmas Easter people that come to worship only on those two days, right? So it's really interesting. And, and it's different educational uh, circles around professions. Uh, we call it continual education credits when you have to go for uh, financials or taxes or whatever else, real estate. You have to go for continual education credit classes, right? So it's interesting that it's almost like the uh, thought came into churchianity and they got the CE credits for Christmas and Easter, CE credits to go and I got my credits in this year. I'm good. I'm, I'm one more year more with being good with God, you know. And they just don't understand because they don't, no one makes it alive to them. No one makes it worth studying. And, and I blame the preachers and the teachers uh, to not make it exciting enough and desirable enough and, and, and in-depth enough to, to make the understanding there that's there more enticing to see and exciting to, to, to spend time on. So anyway, in verse 3 of Second Peter chapter 1, even as his divine power has granted to us all things relating to life and piety through the knowledge, there is again epinosis, of him who called us by glory and virtue on account of which, here we go, 
on account of which. So he called us to be relating to his life and piety, his godliness. So he just got finished saying he could like precious faith. He said you have your epinosis, the knowledge, deeper experiential knowledge is in that level of this, these people up in here. Okay. Then he also goes into uh, the fact that he says this is going to multiply you gra grace and peace. It's going to have his divine power granted to us relating to all things, life and piety. At divine, his divine nature, uh, or power, excuse me, uh, and you have this life and piety. Verse 4, so on account of this, of which very great and precious promises have been bestowed on us, so that through these you might become, become partakers, koinonoi that is, that's a whole different thing, right? Koinonoi of the divine nature, having fled away from the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this is this precious promise I, I often throw out there. It's a precious promise to those in that position that's out ahead for them. So the reason that he has an inclusiveness here about that we might become, because all of us who are in this position don't have that precious promise. The hundred fruit people do. They do. The faithful ones. But the rest of us who are 30 and 60, we got a chance to do that. That's why he says we might become partakers also. Cornanoi. We could do that too. But those who enter the heavens in that position are the ones who have the ability to have this equally like precious faith. To have this ability to have grace and peace multiplied in knowledge. To have this, this life and peace with God and his divine power and divine nature to be partaking of. That's the precious promise. It's unbelievable. It's tremendous. It's just, it's, whew, wow. But it's not for everybody. Okay, so then you see also in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and 12. Yes. Um, Delaney said, does uh, epignosis in verse 2, same as verse 3? <coughs> First one says um, epignosis and the second one is the knowledge, just a different verbiage. Okay, so when, okay, let me go back to where I was. Sorry, I turned the page already. So your question is about asking if the two words for knowledge in verse 2 and verse 3, they're both epinosis. They're both epinosis in the left side of your margin. You'll see the epi in front of the gnosis on each of those words. She said just the article. Oh, I'm sorry. Got you. My apologies. You're referring to the emphatic. A Thank you. You're referring to when he says in verse 2, uh, the grace and peace be multiplied in knowledge, epinosis. Thank you. Versus, he says, the piety having been granted through the knowledge. Because that's, thank you very much. What you're talking about, for and example. Pam said the epinosis in verse 3. Yeah, I got you. You're talking about the article. So, so great. So when you're talking about Second Peter... Chapter 1, verse 2, the epinosis there, the epinosis um, knowledge. Right? Is what he's talking about in he's talking <coughs> about the day, the day seven. So remember that the day seven knowledge that we're gonna have. Um, is well, I should say, yeah. Let's say now into day seven. Uh, I'll put it there. I put. I say now. I'm gonna re. re, re so I don't want to confuse this. So then you have the knowledge. Oh. Epinosis comes up again. He says the epinosis. Because remember, the the emphasizes, okay, which is going to be okay. So when you're having 
because we know we have epinosis now. That's what he's talking about, right? He's, and he's talking about epinosis. He's talking about we have this now in the Bible, many different places. When he puts the article in front of it, the the, he's emphasizing the experience knowledge we're going to have when we have the entrance and we have the extra measure of the other sperma sown, it's obviously going to be an increased knowledge of that same experience. The experience we have now through testing knowledge of the kingdom is going to be a lot greater when more is sown and the environment's changed. That's what he's talking about to your, to your question. I want to make it clear that way. Does that help make sense, I hope? She said thanks. Yep. Okay. So then, as we go into Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 12, he writes this. And by the messenger of the congregation in Philadelphia write, These things says the Holy One, the true, he who has the key of David. He who opens and no one shall shut, and shuts and no one opens. Sounds a lot like a marriage door feast experience that we saw in Matthew 22, doesn't it? Sounds like Matthew 25 when the door is also closed. So the closing of a door and the opening and going through a door. I remember years ago, uh, Sister Vicki asked about doing a study on the doors or gates. And then we talked about how through every growth, there's different, uh, through those salvations, that's the door or the gate through that salvation. The door is Jesus. He says, I am the door, he said. So he's the way through each. There is no way to get to a different salvation without him. Because he's the essential salvation in Christ, in Testament. The only one, bef there's the two salvations before that, which are the salvation from being, or I should say one before that, being brought out of the world and, and out of just the regular world into people of covenant. That's a salvation by God himself to make you aware of who he is in the Bible. But then the salvation in Christ, which is your second salvation in essence, going from covenant to Testament. Now you're in Christ. Well, that salvation, that one going forward, everyone you experience is because in and through and by and, and because of Christ. There's no way of saying, I got to this one without Jesus. You're insane. That, that is not possible. Never will be. Never has been. And it's hogwash if, you, if anybody says that. That's ridiculous. He is the way, the way. <laughs> he is the truth, the life, the door. That's him. You go in and out the pasture through him. So, the, one, the fact that he's talking about the, the key of David and no one, and no one opens and uh, no one shuts, no one shuts, no one opens because he's talking about he, he has the authority at that inspection of the bride to include those who would be within and those who would be without. That's the Father himself, okay? And Jesus, on the behalf of God the Son. So, who's now going to be given those keys of David as the one who's in the reigning of the throne of heaven? In verse 8, I know thy works, behold, I have placed before thee an open door, which no one is able to shut, because thou hast little power, and hast kept my word, and did not deny my name. Now many have this, through the years, said the open door was one of two things. The open door of ministry to the Gentiles, uh, which is a watered-down, churchianity, majority Baptist view, and evangelical view of a lot of missionary view. And then there's the more kingdom studied view people thought it was a rapture reference an open door to be raptured in fact it speaks to what you see in scripture always being spoken about from a door standpoint a door to another entrance into another area of God's intimacy with him like you go from the door of the outer courtyard to the door in the inner court the entrance the, 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 the walkway right the outer courtyard the courtyard the, the, most, the, the, the most holy place and the Holy of Holies. There is different doors from which some enter, some do not. And eventually only one goes in, the high priest, right? So again, this is not new to us. God is giving you this all day long in the Bible. So when he says this here, it doesn't change because we want it to change because of our theology and because of our world we live in. No, no, no. How does God use that reference to doors in the past? How is he always used as a reference to different parts of position, placement, places of honor, privilege, blessings. He's, he, all the time he uses that reference to show that. So that's what he's talking about, about an open door, an opportunity to get privileged and blessed and being honored in a different position with him. And that, again, doesn't say it here, but I'm saying to you the 
door in reference, which I cannot prove, but I can prove what the door you can see in Scripture refers to. Uh, therefore, it, the only door that you could see in the future tense that would be applicable to we would be that to the to Diphon, to the marriage feast, the second part. Verse 9, Behold, I'm giving up those um, from the adversary, from the assembly, excuse me, of the adversary, who declare themselves to be Jews and are not, but speak falsely. I will make themselves to come. I'll make them to come and pay homage before thy feet, and, I, and to know that I loved you. Now, they're going to know, and again, we talk about what these, who these people are, and these are folks that, you know, they want to try to take what we, in the old days, it was the Hebrew Roots Movement, but it's anybody who's trying to take so much of their deeper knowledge of God's Word and try to make it Jewish. The Bible is Jewish. You don't have to make it Jewish. It is. Our Savior is Jewish. You don't have to make him Jewish because he is. He is. Jesus is Jewish. The Bible is Jewish. The apostles are Jewish. What's the problem? There's no problem with that. No problem at all. I know God's not white. I understand that. <laughs> I don't need somebody else to tell me, oh, you're of the white privilege. No, no, I'm not. No, I, I, don't, I got no problem with Jesus being brown, olive skinned. I know he is. So what? I, I know that. Color is, is just a pigmentation. doesn't matter. What's inside your heart? Your spirit, your soul, that's what matters. Okay? So outside skin is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Didn't matter to Jesus. Didn't matter to me. Okay? I don't care. Doesn't really doesn't matter. So what matters is how you conduct yourself, how you hold yourself, how you see yourself from how God tells you to live and act and be unto him, true to yourself, and interact with others. That's what matters to me. That's it. So but some people try to make themselves look and appear to others more pleasing to God by putting on some type of veneer or internal renovation they're trying to do, which is unnecessary to uh, be like that person in the, Old, in the New Testament when Jesus said, who's the one who is the better one who's praying, the one who wants to be elaborate in public and all these prayers, or the one who just says, I don't know what to say, and God just forgive me. It's the simplest, pure, honest thing that God wants. He doesn't want this elaborate. So he doesn't care about your, well, I can hold this Jewish face and that, and I, and I can take this sign and wonder of that and this and tie it to that and and just like the Jews would that and I, but that, but that, but that, but that, but that, but that, no, no, stop trying to be a Jew. Jews seek a sign. We, those in Christ, seek the wisdom of God's word. That's why the two witnesses, they aren't for Gentiles, are they, in tribulation? No, they're for Israel, my friends, as we all know. They're the ones that need to know what's up. We're supposed to already, those of us, us, we're supposed to be gone. But those of our other brothers and sisters in Christ, they're not going to know what's up with certain things about the rapture, but they're certainly going to know what's up when it comes to who Jesus is and who he's not. And they're going to know that that false Messiah is not him. They're going to know that. Those who are walking in faith, oh, yeah, they will. They'll be here for the whole thing, but they'll know that ain't, that's not right. The witnesses aren't testifying for their benefit. They're testifying for the Jews who are not, not they don't know. Because they need that sign. We've been given the wisdom of God's word. So, within that being said, verse 10, Revelation chapter 3, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I love that, the word of my patience. So it isn't just, it's a, it's a phrasing, and it's the word of the patience. Speaking to not just patience, but it's the patience. It's the patience that's emphasized as not just trusting God through hard times, but but it emphasizes one who's done it through a journey of depth and width and length and height. You know, like Job. You know, like Paul. You know, like the apostles. Like the women, don't short count them, right? The Esthers, the Rebeccas, the Eves, you know, the Sarahs. The ones who had enough guts to speak up. The ones who had enough gumption to stand up. The ones who had enough to fill in Deborah when the other wouldn't. You know, it's any man or woman who just stood in the gap of truth and righteousness and what was holy unto God because regardless of their outcome, they knew that was right. And when you do that one time, okay. So when you have enough patience to, to, to gird up under and, 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 and trust in God, that's one thing. But when you do it constantly through the roller coaster of life, 
that's more the emphasis, not just in regular life situations, I mean in a spiritual defining moments of God forging in his, his will and through your life, in and through your life. So the word of the patience, that's why the word is attached to it. It isn't just patience in life, but it's the patience. Not just the patience by itself, but it's the patience of life changing and how it goes back to how you're deepening in your word of understanding of God's word and how it relates to the experience he gave you. And again, that's why I want to talk to Job when I get to heaven. He's one of the guys in the Old Testament I want a front and center conversation with as we're awaiting everything to kind of fall in place. You know, I, I wouldn't I would love to have a seat at the table next to him. You know, just want to hear some stuff that he could tell me. All right. Very intriguing to me. So also in verse ten, I also will keep thee from the hour of trial which is about to come on the whole habitable to try those who dwell on the earth. Referring to those faithful ones who have already lived and died, obviously it didn't apply to them, but to at some point in the future, which we're in now, there'll be a people who are obtaining the hundred under fruit here, faithful ones, who will be withheld from that hour of trial, meaning the tribulation period, earmarked by them being taken out prior to uh, the beginning of the peace treaty being signed, which can't be signed until the temple is rebuilt. The temple can't be rebuilt unless the Dome of the Rock is destroyed. So verse 11, it says, I'm coming speedily, hold fast, thou may, uh, so to hold fast that thou hast, that you have, that no one may take your crown. He's referring to again that your crown may not be uh, taken by you or me being engaged in the affairs of this life. He talks about it in James, do not love the world, enmity with God. Uh, do not hate your brother. The love of God doesn't reside in you. So John and James give you hints about, you don't do certain stuff, man. It's, it's going to take away your crown. You can't possibly harbor hatred and bitterness and malice and think to yourself, well, God's not going to take the crown that I'm, I'm in position to, to have, is he? Why wouldn't he? Are you crazy? You can't. You can't do that. You can't do that. You, you cannot have some fruit of the Spirit in one way over here and then some fruit of the flesh over here and act like they don't infect each other. They're in the same bushel of you, your soul. If the bushel of your soul holds both those fruits, my friend. How can they both coexist without the, the rotten spoiling the good? Of course it's going to. Root it out, man. That's why... Hebrews 12 says the root of bitterness will take away your joy now, your reward later, paraphrase. You gotta, you gotta get over that stuff. We're about to finish up soon. Okay. So let me finish up on verse 12. So the conqueror, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall never go out more. And I will write him on the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem the coming down out of the heaven from my God in my new name. So the pillar is the permanent support structure. So I want you to see, uh, and we're going to end off on this. My wife, my babes had given me the signal because I didn't want to actually overextend myself because of me being sick here. Yes? And Todd said in verse 10, I have underlined the whole habitable as the house of God. Does that make any sense? The whole, well, the whole habitable, yeah. no, I wouldn't say it's the whole house of God. The whole habitable has a, has a reference, uh, as we saw in the book of Acts, it's used in many different, many different parameters. I had to kill a bug. It's used in many different parameters, um, that, what you just said. So the whole habitable could mean a reference to like we saw in the Roman days, uh, a certain person's home, a, a certain uh, person's house, their family relatives. It could mean a region. could mean all of Rome. It's, it's used in many different ways. We saw that in the book of Acts, if you remember. So in this case, he's using it from a context, and he says, keep from an hour of trial, which is about to come on the whole habitable to those who dwell on the earth. So it, it could be, as what I'm not saying it's not. That's in the context it's correct in how it's going to apply. It is going to come upon all the rest of the people that are in God's house. It's just going to be the faithful ones taken out so that you are correct. Because um, those who dwell on the earth, it's everybody. But the whole habitable uh, does have, and I've mentioned this in the past, in this particular context, I just want to be careful that I, I, don't, I don't want to make you think that the phrasing always means the same definition. 
That's all I'm saying. It's used in a, a various ways. I showed before in the book of Acts was the best way to see it. It's used to speak of a small group, a large group, but nonetheless, it is consistently the principle of it earmarks a group. It doesn't have parameters as it always has to be a large group or a small group or the same group. It's just a group. Yes. And Todd said, I don't know why I have that written. Vicki said, I have a note next to verse 10 as wave one. It Lady is. He said, I have wave four. Pam said, I have the wheat harvest. <laughs> so this is this is the fine wheat, right? And Vicki said, is referring to the Church of Philadelphia. It is. It's the wheat harvest, um, which is later on going to be disclosed as the fine wheat when it gets sifted at the end of day seven. But it's the beginning of the wheat harvest. You're correct. It's the early wheat harvest is what you're looking at, um, what's going to happen here. So, so yeah, it, it is the beginning of that. Um, it's not wave four. Uh, it's wave one. Uh, wave four is when you have the, well, you're probably putting that wave four there, which is not wrong application-wise. It would be wrong, but in a sense of identif identifying it with that is not wrong because way four people who are the soon famed faithful 144 soon medicos thousand people they join these group of people to become the faithful ones. So if you're using wave four to associate wave one and four together, which is what First Thessalonians four does, when it says there's a meeting in the air, that's that's why that there's that meeting in the air because wave one and four become one and the same people. So if you're putting wave four there to denote that, then that's that's fine. But it's not talking about them specifically. It's just referring to them ancillarily, if you will, because they will be involved in a in a similitude of likened uh, treatment unto those in wave one. Lady said okay. So that's so you're not wrong in the in the direct application. Um, it's wrong, but you're um, you are correct in the in the ancillary holistic of it all. That they're going to be infused together with those in wave one, which is what it's directly speaking to. So, the pillar is a permanent fixture in verse 12, and it's uh, a support structure. So, if you go to Colossians 1 8, I can show you the. You said it relates back to Hebrews 6 12. Hebrews 6 12. Yes in order that they may not become sluggish but imitators of those who through patience, faith and patience, endurance are inheriting the promises. Yep, through faith and long, yep, the macothumia, yep, and it's correct. Yep, so in Colossians uh, 1.8, I'm gonna, or Colossians, Corinthians 1.8, I'm gonna end soon, sorry. He says that when he uses this um, anapoliptos, as we saw already in verse, um, uh, seven, or excuse me, eight, in verse eight. He says they will also confirm you, that is the bio, confirm you to the end. Irreproachable in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word is babayo, fixed, firm. Think of, if you go over, I said Colossians, if you go to Colossians 2, seven, this is the same word that you see used in Revelation, I'm going to show you, but go to Colossians 2, 7, and you will also see this word, babayo, used, rooted and built up in him and established. So that is babayo, in the faith, even as you were taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Hebrews 2, 3, we saw earlier tonight, we started off with that verse to come full circle back to that verse. As we're closing out on our time together, Hebrews 2 3, he says, How shall we escape having disregarded so great salvation, which beginning to be spoken by the Lord was Babayo confirmed? Okay, for us by those who heard him. So we have a, for the wording here, this Babayo from Revelation 3 12, when he says that. He will have a permanent support. So a, the fact that he's going to confirm us and establish us, and those, those verbiages resonate with me from Colossians 1.8 to, I mean, Corinthians 1.8 to Colossians 2.7 to Hebrews 2.3. 
that word vavayo has this has this fixed affirming uh, nature to it which really coincides with what a pillar is which is a fixed affirming piece right which by the way is no coincidence that there are two pillars and and that are fixed the jachan and boaz in the actual temple and we know in first Kings 721 and from also second chronicles 317 and i put that on the board already for you the babayo fixed firm like and done too and i put the already on the board for you the pillars that Jachin on the right means the Lord establishes, and Boaz means only in him is their strength. So it's, it's very uh, powerful uh, to see that that's what God is going to give to those who are of this faithful one, a near status, their precious promise. Part of their precious, part of their precious, part of their precious promises he talks about over in here he talks about that in, in verse 4 is things like being a pillar affixed in the temple now when God says that if you're a Jew and you hear the phrase staking of a tabernacle versus putting a pillar in the temple. And there's two of them that are by name, the two jockeying and Boaz. Those are, those are, those are big deals, man. <laughs> the Lord establishes you, and the Lord only in him is, is their strength. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. I guarantee it. If he's going to call you a pillar, and that pillar is associated with the temple, you're not going anywhere. You're a permanent fixture, my friend. You're a betrothed bride just waiting to be revealed as the bride consummated with him in the Dipnon and Dei. It's a fact. It's a matter of time. Okay, so as far as the new name, he says at the very bottom, and he said at verse 12 of Revelation 3, I will write on him a new name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem that come out of heaven from, from my God and my new name. Oh, his new name? Yeah, the, 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 it never, never before known. The Kanos, new, never before known. It's the name, of course, it's not just a name, but it's the nomia, the name of no longer king judge. Now he's the bridegroom. Yeah, hello. That's a, that's a new name. He hadn't had that yet. He hadn't been called bridegroom yet. Oh, but he will. Oh, but he will. He's been king judge for a while on the earth, but he'll be. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. So they're going to have this here, and they're going to get a new name. which is the bride of the bridegroom. So that's what's being talked about here in Revelation. Revelation 3.12. Okay? And I'll just do, I promise that was the last one, but I'm going to do just one more and that's it. I won't, just one more verse, I promise. This is it. I've been waiting to do this for like three weeks now. I just want to at least cover it. My goodness. It's taking me so long to get. So 1 Timothy 6.14. In 1 Timothy 6.14, he says, well, 13 and 14 for context, I charge thee in the presence of that God, the Anopian, in the sight of God, who makes alive all things, and that Christ Jesus, who testified to Pontius Pilate, the good confession, that you, that thou, keep the commandment. You keep the commandment. Being spotless, aspilos, and blameless, anapoliptos, till the appearance. By the way, all you got to do, remember, aspilos, anapoliptos. You're talking, if you go back to your, well, it's in my, I'm trying to say, go back to your dialogue in the back. I wrote it down for me. So the aspilos, anapoliptos, aspilos, in day seven, anapoliptos. Also at day seven. I believe those is for the called out ones. I speak those for the faithful ones. So be prepared as those who are about to enter the heavens, being spotless, till the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the word appearance. It's the epiphania. So what's he saying? Maintain until the rapture of wave one. Because wave one is going to involve the Aspilos person, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 
So it all ties in. I wanted to end with that to tie it in. The first, the first Timothy. So the first Timothy. Six fourteen. The Epiphania, if I spell that right, or the appearing. It's just like on your chart of the days of Scripture. Equals wave one watchfulness. Be watchful to be asphilos and anaphiliptos. This is a hundred fruit, sixty, thirty fruit. That's what he's saying. So I just want to make sure we ended with that because now we're over time and I got to stop. What's that? Said, did you say both words were day seven? Yes. They're both dealing with day seven, dif different groups of people. The Aspilos is dealing with the persons who are 100 fruit, specifically. The, Anap the Anapoliptos is dealing with folks who are also included as 60 and 30 people that could ascend here and or people that already had 30, 60 and have ascended here. So don't forget, once you're Aspilos, you don't lose being called Anapoliptos. What you were, you just add to. You don't lose what you were. So an Aspilos person is Anapoliptos. An Anapoliptos person has to grow to be Aspilos. There's a difference. So a person who has 30 and 60 fruit then goes to 100 doesn't lose that fruit. They still have that. They just have more. That's why Jesus said in the parable, see who has more, more will be given, right? So he doesn't lose what he's got. He has more. <coughs> he doesn't say a person doesn't put old wine in new wineskins. He, he, he said that, but he didn't say he destroys the old wine, does he? No. He still has it. <laughs> he still he just doesn't put it together. He doesn't inter inter intermix those things when, when they're not supposed to be. He pulls them out when they need to be used, but he's not. That wastes the whole part. You don't mix them together. So that's the whole thing here. So, so I want to make sure we kind of saw more. Well, I'll finish up. I, I promise you this. I should be able to, God willing, finish this up. I'm not in some physical state. I was so pressed and I, I wanted to have this tonight because I was so, felt so bad about Sunday. And I'm very, very sorry about that, uh, that this technology just shut us down. I just so, I was heartbroken about that because that's just, that's our time. It's like me coming before you blind, deaf, and mute. It, it stinks. But it was God's will and we just had to get through it and that's why I felt it so emboldened upon me that I had to meet tonight with you guys. So, um, we have some questions here, and then we'll close. Yes. Vicki Herstall said uh, it charged us to keep the commandment. Which commandment? Oh, sorry. Todd said, do you think we will finish this by Memorial Weekend? Memorial Day weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> yes, you silly. And, um, Pam said the greatest of these is love, I believe, Lainey. Uh, Vicky being spotless and blameless. Pam, uh, sorry, I mean Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when he said, <laughs> it's just so funny. When he says uh, the commandment, Remember he said before that Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus testified to Pontius Pilate the good confession that thou keep the commandment. So, so when he talks about uh, what Jesus testified before Pontius Pilate about was about the commandment <coughs> that thou shalt love the Lord thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. So I would, you can encompass that into what we've always said, the commandment to trust and obey the Lord uh, in all and every throughout situations, circumstances that are in your life. That's why Hebrews 12, it, it sh you can hang it on your, on your wall and on your mindset. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Excuse me? That wasn't, he wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to get pummeled and betrayed and nails in my hands and scars and, and whipped and yeah, spit on. It sounds awesome. I can't wait for my creation of peons to have their way with me. I can't wait to be a subjected you know, slave 
as King of kings and Lord of lords and the powerful being of everything I survey and subject myself to just utter disrepute. You know, I can't wait for that. Of course he wasn't saying that. He's saying for the joy of the commandment of doing the Father's will with joy, not with begrudging mints or with murmurings, but with joy. So that's why I say none of us should, should feel alone. You should find strength through your own struggles, through your own heartache, through your own trials. Because when you have a cross stand, you know, laying de- next to, figuratively speaking, a throne, I mean, come on. He understands, man. There's no way you can ever say, well, you know, he's the appearance that he's God. Yeah, just exactly. Why would a God who could have it easy take such a hard, ridiculous road to subject himself? And I tell you and I submit to you, it's because you and I can therefore say, now I get it. Things that have, are, or might happen in the future that are so disgusting to us. How could you get benefits and blessings out of that? And, I, and you go, oh yeah, you subjected yourself to the same rules and you experienced such heinous treatment that you ordained for yourself? Makes no sense. But thank you, Lord, for doing that because it does make sense to help me stomach and filter that, you know what? Gosh, you brought the most beautiful thing of all time out of that. Resurrection. So I'm going to rise from the ashes too like the phoenix, man. And I'm going to have new life through all my tragedies and pain and heartache. I refuse to let them get the better of me. I'm not doing that. Yes. Vicki says the two additional. The two additional. Aspilos and Anapolitos? I'm just kidding. You did that one? What to do? That's your time out? No, Jesus, two additional commandments. <coughs> to love your neighbor as yourself, you're talking about that? What's that? So you say it's just trust and obey. Well, I'm just, no, I'm just, some, no. I'm saying what you're saying. I'm saying it's, it's on the two commandments, all the law rest. When he said, love your Lord, your God, your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus made that very clear. That's the greatest commandment. You know, it's all on the basis of all love. Love your Lord God, love your neighbor as yourself. So love is the beginning of both of those commandments. So the commandment is love. And so if you want to sum it up, it's love. You can't. You can't start saying the first command without saying the word love. You can't just say love your Lord. You can't just say, you know, the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul. You know what? Love? Okay, there you go. And what is God? Love. And what are the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Singular. So, and all the things out of that. So, just like the fruits of the Spirit, plural, come out of love, because it says the fruit of the Spirit, singular, love, and it has other things. They describe love. I contend that the commandment of loving the Lord God by your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself are contingent upon the love, which is the emphasis. And I then go back to what I know Jesus said about love. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he it is that loves me. Well, there you go. That means you have, to, you, have to, you have to obey him. In order to obey him, you have to do what? Trust him. That's why I say trust and obey. I'm just summing it up in an easy way, but I'm, that I'm not by no means diminishing what Jesus said. I'm just trying to make it easy. Oh, my goodness. Yeshua, what he said goes, man. So it's, it's the loving Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, absolutely, and it's loving neighbor as yourself. But to sum that up, it just means trust and obey God, and love will come out of that for, for him and for others. That, that, that's what I'm saying. Yes? And she said, right, they are interconnected for sure. Yep. I, I, I'm sorry if I, I didn't want to ever, God forbid, diminish what he says oh by no means I just want to make it simpler uh, for easier remembrance and, and, and re- recall for us okay so uh, let's uh, let's 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 pray for our session for today and we'll, we'll convene so let's pray father we thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together with you thank you for the time and your willingness to continue to work in and through us continue to touch us and guide us father in your will and your way and understanding Thank you for this opportunity we have coming up on this Easter to think and celebrate and just be so grateful for what you have done. So we just ask you to be with us throughout the weekend. Bring us back together safely, Father. 
in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So, you guys, um, I'm going to get